So tonight, as some are asking if Donald Trump's beginning to fade in the 2016 race, we'll ask if it's wishful thinking or maybe reality. New numbers suggest that he just might be in some trouble. So how will that impact tomorrow's critical GOP debate? We'll ask the panel. Plus, the charter school debate. Last night, we introduced you to a critic of the schools, and tonight, the other side of the issue with a parent and an avid supporter of charters. And later, yes, it is that time. Let's go Mets. New Yorkers set to take on Kansas City as the 2015 World Series opens tonight. We will get you ready for game one. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, all the pregame hype over, all the analysis, predictions in full swing, and soon it will be game time. And no, I'm not talking about the Mets and Royals a little bit later on in the program, a World Series preview coming up your way at the bottom half of the hour. No, the big game I'm referring to is tomorrow night's third Republican presidential debate. It will be in Boulder, Colorado, a swing state, and will be aired on and hosted by the business channel CNBC. And while the first two Republican debates seem very much focused on the guy in the middle there, Donald Trump, there is reason to believe tomorrow may read from a different script. That is because Trump's numbers aren't what they used to be. In fact, he may not even be the front runner come tomorrow. Yesterday's poll has Ben Carson up 14 points over Trump in Iowa. And as it turns out, Trump has not led any Iowa polls this month. The average lead for Carson in this month's Iowa polls is now sitting at, at almost double digits. And this may be more than just an Iowa trend. Today's New York Times CBS News national poll of Republicans, again, of Republicans only, has Carson with a four-point lead over Trump. Behind them, Marco Rubio closing fast, Jeb Bush still in trouble, as well as Carly Fiorina. No other candidate polls above 5%. This poll could be a big deal. It is the first national poll since Trump that Trump has not led. You'd have to go back to July to see a different front runner. And there's every sign that Republican voters have yet to really plug in to this presidential race. In that same poll that we just mentioned, nearly half of Republicans say they're not yet paying much or any attention to the race as of yet. And 71 percent say it is way too early for them to make up their minds. So the question is, what should we make of those numbers and what should we expect to see in tomorrow night's debate? Let's bring in our panel. We are joined here by Dominic Carter, political journalist and author, Jessica Proud. She, a Republican strategist and PR expert with the November team, and Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent. All right, guys, now, Jessica, I'm sure you're really upset to see Trump fading. Uh, I kid. Uh, but I said this before. Um, uh, Trump points out that South Carolina, New Hampshire is still up. Uh, some polls still have him up nationally as the Republican. Is this wishful thinking for folks who'd love to see him become yesterday's news, or do you think it's the beginning of the end? Well, I think that there was always the assumption that the polls are going to fluctuate. It's a presidential race, and there's so many candidates. And depending on what happens in the news that day, that can affect a poll, which is just really, at the end of the day, just a snapshot in time. But what I find really interesting is the fact that he's based pretty much his entire candidacy on the fact that he's winning in the polls. So what's going to start happening if right. those numbers change? You know, that's, the, that's his rationale, really, for running. So... Um, when he can't no, any longer talk about the polls, what is he going to talk about? He's either going to have to shift to serious substantive policy issues or just start attacking the, the other candidates, which you also saw him attack the voters in yep. Iowa last week. Which uh, was and a, I want to talk about Iowa in a second <laughs> with Andrew, but before we even get to Iowa, we've got the debate tomorrow night, okay? Um, the first one we saw... Uh, Fox News, whether it was coordinated or otherwise, clearly Trump was the focus, and you can argue the panel went right after Trump, or at least Megyn Kelly. What happens this time around? It's interesting. Um, Trump, by the playbook, went after uh, Bush again. He said he went to mommy and daddy to get campaign advice. Bush seemed to all but ignore him and went after Rubio instead. My, my question is, does he still become a target tomorrow night from the folks in the panel or the ones asking the questions, or does this pivot now and become about something else? You have so many subplots going on tomorrow night. As Jessica accurately pointed out, a poll is a snapshot in time. So this is only one poll, one, that shows Trump is not the front runner. I contend he peaked too early 
unfortunately for him, and it's the beginning of the end, and all of the outrageous, crazy things that he tries to throw out there every day on a daily basis, it's going to be completely irrelevant now. But he's going to be the focus, that is Donald Trump, again tomorrow night. I'm watching for the personal battle between Jeb Bush, because it's almost life or death for Mr. Bush, uh, Jeb Bush and Trump. Jeb Bush has already indicated, Richard, that the gloves will be off in terms of his tone, in terms of, and it's something I think many of us have been waiting to see, why are you letting Donald Trump just run all over you? And I think that's going to change tomorrow night. So many plots, also an interesting one uh, to see how Marco Rubio does mm. tomorrow night. Who's got the most to win and who's got the most to lose tomorrow? I think Marco Rubio has the most to win. He seems to be well positioned to sort of become the mainstream front runner should he take that uh, spotlight and actually make the most of it. I think most to lose, you know, Carson and Trump because they're at the head of the field. And, and I think Trump needs a second act. And, we're, and, you know, I don't think anybody on this panel is willing to bet the farm that he doesn't have a second act considering how wrong we've been, how really? wrong so many yep. Republicans I, I, I have been. I think he has no, I think he's, give, he's given everything that he's got and there is no second act. And I'm and glad you're on the record about that because every prediction that we've all gone through when it came to Trump, whether he would run, whether he would file the paperwork, whether he would be the front runner, have all proven to be wrong, whether he would fade after the McCain thing, that sort of thing. Uh, you asked me also uh, who has the, the most to gain. Uh, I, again, I think it's Rubio. I think Jeb Bush also has a lot to gain as well. He's, it's... It's not make or break for Jeb Bush yet. He needs a good performance to buoy his numbers, but he's got such a big bankroll that if he's just, if the war of attrition continues and some of the people at the bottom of the, of the scale fall away, he starts to look better and better simply because there are fewer people around and he gets a chance to perform in an environment that he's better at. It's true, but I also think, and it's a little bit of a different dynamic in this race, Money is not calling the shots in this race. It, the earned media is having a tremendous impact on the yep. polls right now. So I don't think, while Jeb still Explain leads in the money the race, it, that's getting press and go retail, campaigning, making news, and, and Trump, act, you know, yeah. obviously is the, the best yeah. at doing that. Um, so it, it's a really interesting dynamic because you always want to be the candidate with the biggest bank account because you're paid messaging, your campaign commercials, your mail, all of your literature. That's, you know, typically what kind of drives numbers in a race. And you're not seeing that happen so much, mm. you know, in it, these early swing states. And you made a point, Andrew, that the calendar might have been an enemy here so far for Republicans that Iowa um, and who the electorate are in Iowa, and if you look at history as a guide, They've had to pivot so far to the right for the Christian conservative vote right now that it may come back to Biden because they're defining themselves in a place that's going to be hard to pivot back to the center. I think Republicans would be better served if Iowa wasn't the first state on their calendar for a caucus or for a primary because four years ago the winner of Iowa was Rick Santorum. Eight years ago the winner was Mike Huckabee. They, they have a, an affinity for religious conservatives and they have an affinity for Tea Party slash free, Freedom Caucus slash very right-wing conservatives. And I don't think that helps the Republican Party in the overall. It forces a lot of candidates to pivot that much further to the right, which eventually you're going to have a nominee that then has to come back and start moving back towards the left. And you wind up with all these process stories that we do about, you know, is the party shifting too far to the right and, and, and that sort of thing. I, I think... If there were almost any other state in the country, if New Hampshire was first, that would be better. If a state like Colorado or, or New Mexico was first, that would be better. But, you know, Iowa politics are not particularly kind to the GOP. Right Richard, now. but the, the in fairness to the GOP, they have tried to deal with the Iowa issue several times. And, and every time a, a primary is moved from a different state, Iowa comes mm -hmm. back again and yep. changes there so that they're first in the nation. So Yeah, but let's be honest. I mean, you can't really, you know, with the way the press works today, you can, and social media, you can't run two separate messages in different states. I mean, that doesn't work No, anymore. but you do have candidates so who are you, focusing uh, on New So Hampshire. what happens, what you say in Iowa is you're talking about it in New Hampshire, no, or you're talking about it in New Hampshire, they're going to do this debate Iowa. tomorrow in Colorado, which is a swing state. If you're trying to appeal to a Colorado Republican voter, it's a different audience than you're going to be if you're trying to do, to Andrew's point, to the hardline Christian conservative in Iowa right now. And, and clearly, you're playing to the crowd. And in this case, the crowd is you want to get out of the gate strong, you know? 
Santorum would never have won Colorado, you know, out of the gate. You know what of I mean? Of course, yeah. Bush and you look at Jeb. I mean, yeah. his team said from day one, we're going to lose the primary to win the general. That was their strategy. And look how well that's yeah, working. Exactly. But, there, but there's a reason that Rubio and Bush and Christie and so many other and Kasich are focused on New Hampshire primarily and not spending as much time or as much energy in Iowa because it's distracting from the message. And yet there's still all of these poll numbers You're right, out of Iowa. But nobody oh, wants yeah. to vote for a loser. And the worry is if you can't come out of the gates at least respectable in Iowa, some people might go away before New Hampshire even happens. All right. We got news out of Washington. John Boehner just cut a budget deal with the Democrats, but the guy who could be the next speaker, he's not doing cartwheels over it. We're going to tell you about the spat between Ryan and Boehner and whether or not this whole thing was staged or not. Stay with us.